Professor Vedu Gopalan, who has been at uh, uh, Brookhaven for a very long time and is also an adjunct professor at the Stony Brook University, will be with us still tomorrow morning. So if you have any questions after the talk, he will be here at the guest house and you can talk to him after the talk. Uh, welcome, Dr. Vedu Gopalan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, gosh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, see some old friends. Um, I should mention that um, I had a very good friend here, um, Professor Rahul Basu, who uh, was a great personal friend of mine. And sadly, he passed away some years ago. And uh, this is the first time I'm coming back to IMSC after his passing, so it's, it's been a long time, and uh, it's, uh, somehow I see his face everywhere. Uh, anyway, it's great that he's been recognized, uh, but I guess there's a scholarship in his honor um, that's given yearly for the best uh, thesis awards in, in, uh, in India, so, so I'm, I'm really glad that uh, his memory is alive. Uh, anyway, uh, I didn't mean to start on a somber note, but I just wanted to acknowledge his memory. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to talk about is this uh, peculiar sounding title. And uh, for um, some of you, it might ring a bell. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it comes from a lecture uh, given by Sidney Coleman, who's shown here. So this is Sidney Coleman on the occasion of his receiving the Dirac Medal. Uh, and here's Abdul Salam, who uh, was the director of ICTP at that time, awarding him this medal, and there's Dirac in the background, uh, so some luminaries there. So anyway, Sidney Coleman is a great uh, lecturer uh, and uh, expert in quantum field theory, and so he had the title of this lecture, which was... Uh, uh, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there is it, is, it, is the sound okay or is it too loud? Maybe I should uh, lower this. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, so Coleman was a great field theory expert, and he had a title of one of his lectures on classical lumps and the quantum descendants, which I liked very much. Uh, I'm going to use it in a somewhat different context from Coleman. Uh, although there are some deep connections to, to what he was talking about. Um, and, and the question I'm going to uh, ask, and, uh, and I'll only kind of get to it in the middle of my talk, but I'll be kind of building up to it, is can we understand such extreme events that you see uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, which are, these are actually proton-proton collisions. Okay? And they generate, uh, in very rare events, and they generate uh, over a hundred particles, um, and, and um, of course, in heavy ion collisions, you generate thousands of particles. Uh, and the question is, can we understand such configurations of matter as being classical uh, objects, which then, um, which are generated in this high energy scattering, and, and, and what, what are the consequences of this? Now, conventional wisdom would say no to such the creation of such classical lumps and such highly quantum processes. Um, and, and I'm going to argue to you that this classical wisdom is, is wrong. And this also has consequences for things like creation of black holes uh, and transplankin scattering, so primordial black holes that, that was just disgusting. Um, so here's the outline of my talk, so I'm going to kind of build up to this. And, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and, and ask me about them. Uh, so I'm first going to talk about quantum chromodynamics, um, and which is an extremely successful theory. It's an almost perfect theory, as I will discuss. Uh, and perhaps the most perfect theory known to, to humankind that we have. Um, and this theory is very rich and has a lot of emergent structure, which is not visible from writing down the equations of motion of the theory. And I'm going to describe some of that, how that comes about. And then I'm going to get to this, uh, the title of my talk, which is uh, how some of this emergent phenomena involves classical lumps uh, and some of their 
uh, consequences. Uh, in particular, I'm going to show that such objects have universal features. There are examples in cold atoms and in gravity which are um, universal to this matter. So even though uh, this is specific to QCD, there are aspects of it that are independent of the micro microscopic uh, nature of the interactions, in specifically because these are classical lumps. And finally, I'm going to talk about the future, um, which is where always a talk should head, is um, I'm going to talk about the electron ion collider briefly, which is a machine that's being constructed in the United States. It's the only collider uh, in construction in the United States. Uh, and it's the ultimate QCD femtoscope and it's going to study in great precision the tomography of strongly interacting matter and hopefully will let us understand some of the enduring mysteries of this of this of this uh, of this very rich uh, and fundamental theory that we have uh, so okay so what is quantum chromodynamics so as I mentioned uh, QCD is a nearly perfect quantum field theory and it's nearly perfect because it has almost no parameters. The only parameters are the quark masses which come from the Higgs mechanism. But if you put the quark masses to zero, uh, the theory is perfect in the sense that it's all the phenomena of the theory are emergent phenomena. They come from the structure of the theory, not the uh, parameters that one puts in. And if you think of the history of physics, that's rather unique. We don't have theories like that. We never had theories like that which are uh, which have no parameters put in. Uh, historically in physics you, you know, write down some sets of equations and you put in parameters and you try to fit data uh, and, and sort of you tune those parameters appropriately. Uh, here there's no tuning whatsoever in the, in the, in the masses limit. Um, and, and so in that sense it's a nearly perfect theory. Uh, and, and the theory is very rich in symmetries and we know for a long time that it's symmetries that dictate interactions. So if you write down uh, a Lagrangian for a theory with a kinetic term and then you impose that it satisfies certain symmetries, that generates all the interactions of the theories. Uh, and so it has these, these symmetries here uh, and I just enumerate them. So it has a gauge symmetry, which is that of color charge. Uh, and the symmetry, so quark and gluon fields are uh, matrices under this color, SU3 color group uh, at each point in space time. So that's why it's a gauge symmetry. And the symmetry is unbroken. Um, so uh, this is an exact symmetry of the theory. But it's confined in the sense that you never see quarks and gluons freely in nature. Um, it's not a bug, but a feature of the theory uh, called confinement. Um, and the theory has a global symmetry, and that's a so-called chiral handedness symmetry, uh, in the sense that if the theory were massless, the quarks were massless, then left-handed and right-handed quarks would rotate in independently of each other. They would not talk to each other uh, in the strictly in the massless limit. So it's an exact symmetry in that limit, but it's broken for mass, massive quarks. And the nature of how it's broken spontaneously uh, is, explains why we exist. So the reason why we have mass and nucleons and, and pions and other subatomic particles have mass is because of the breaking of this global symmetry in a particular and very, uh, in a very specific manner. Uh, the theory also has uh, conserved charges, the baryon number and the axial charge, which again, uh, the latter for massless quarks is conserved. Uh, and then it has scale invariance, uh, again for massless quarks and gluon fields. So if you vary the scales of the fields, there, the theory is invariant. And it has the discrete CP and T symmetries, charge, parity, and time reversal. Now, all of these symmetries with the exception of the gauge symmetry, as I mentioned, um, are broken symmetries. So they're, um, the, the vacuum of the theory does not respect the symmetries of the Lagrangian. 
and or, or by by quantum effects as well. So you can have quantum effects which break the symmetries. And this is the, the pattern of these breaking, as I alluded to, are what gave rise to the rich structure of the theory. So all the all the uh, existence of subatomic particles, their masses, their spins, their interactions with each other, uh, are all a consequence of this emergent phenomena, right? So, so most of the visible matter in the universe comes from this pattern. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That that well that that's right. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. So. Uh, Theta is very, very small. So there's a, um, as was mentioned, there's, there's an additional possibility that a theory could have a theta term which violates um, CP. And, um, uh, but in practice, the theta term is, is found to be very small. So experiments suggest that it's less than one part in 10 to the 10. Um, and, and, uh, but there's a possibility that uh, if it's non-zero, there could be another particle called the axion, which which uh, is required to, uh, which would explain why this number is not is so small, that uh, why it's almost a symmetry, um, and so so that's that's of course an important point, uh, and I'll very briefly mention some aspect related to that. So so. Um, so to summarize, inherent in QCD are the deepest aspects of relativistic quantum field theory. So if you understand QCD, you're very well prepared to understand the standard model and beyond the standard model. Um, because it has many of the features, non-trivial features of, of, of our constructions of, of theories, uh, such as confinement, asymptotic freedom, um, anomalies, Spontaneous break in chiral symmetry, uh, and so on. So um, it's a it's a it's a it's a very valid, uh, it's a very important theory from all of these reasons that we need to understand better. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about that. Um, so um, now, of course, when you write such thing on a page, it it um, it hides a long and enduring struggle over many decades, which the theory took to become what it is today. Uh, and so it started out by trying to make sense of the zoo of subatomic particles that are being discovered in the 50s and 60s um, and trying to organize them in some way uh, in the language of symmetries. Uh, and that was, a lot of it was a pioneering work of Gelman um, uh, and also Zwig um, successfully. Um, and where they came up with this idea of the so-called eightfold way that you could um, organize mesons into octets and baryons into decaplets. Um, but this, and so quarks gave a way to kind of organize this, but um, they, were, they were not really thought of as being necessarily something real, just a mathematical shorthand for organizing the properties of these objects. Um, and there were some issues about how do you relate these to weak currents and so on. So there was a very kind of ugly pupae which then evolved into a caterpillar. Um, and then, you know, it, it sort of built a chrysalis around it which got sort of harder, uh, which came with further richness that there was a new color charge uh, that was required to explain uh, the or this organization in terms of quarks. But even then, people thought of quarks as maybe integer valued objects. They weren't sure they were fractionally charged. Uh, and there was no dynamics and no understanding of confinement. And then finally, prompted by data on deep plastic scattering, uh, it was realized that these objects are actually real um, and uh, just as real as you and I. Uh, and and um, and this is what kind of led to you know the modern theory of strong interactions with this beautiful Lagrangian, which was first written down by Geldman, Fritsch, and Leutbiller. I understand that Fritsch died very recently. Um, and so so this is a kind of lepidop lepidopteral metaphor of how this very ugly pupae kind of evolved into this very beautiful butterfly. Uh, and there was a nice talk by Jeffrey Mandula at the uh, retirement symposium of my colleague, uh, Mike Kreutz, 
at Brookhaven. Uh, and you can kind of find his slides on the internet and uh, take a look uh, where he elaborates on this. Um, so, uh, so what is QCD? So as I mentioned, the QCD is this nearly perfect theory, but it's a very complex theory in the sense that the, it, it sort of led us to think more deeply about quantum field theory. So when you write down the Lagrangian for a quantum field theory, uh, gauge theory in particular, sorry, um, it's, um, it's not really well defined. It is beset by uh, infrared and ultraviolet uh, divergences, which you have to understand. So the bare Lagrangian doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and this was really most deeply understood by Ken Wilson. So he's sitting there holding what uh, you might, it's, it's called a telephone. So some of you may not realize that. You know, it's like old rotary phone. And, and behind him are banks of what are called computers. Um, which, you know, look very different from what we have now. Uh, and so, so Ken Wilson understood that the lattice regularization is not just a numerical way to try and solve this theory, but it's a fundamental way of thinking about quantum field theories in general, uh, and that by putting the theories on a lattice involved thinking about how to, how to uh, understand on uh, the, the fields of the theory, and in fact gave a deeper understanding of confinement that I mentioned, why quarks and gluons are not free. Uh, and, and this was a very powerful, uh, powerful framework because it gave a first principles treatment of the static properties of QCD. Uh, the masses, moments, and thermodynamics at finite temperature and, and chemical potential um, to some extent. Uh, and, and here's a plot which kind of reflects the success of QCD as a non-perturbative realization <coughs> um, of, of, of the theory by, by plotting on the y-axis the masses uh, of, the, uh, of the various particles in the hadron spectrum uh, as a, uh, uh, and compared to ex experiments. So, so in, on the lattice, because when you discretize a theory, there's no scale because, as I said, it's a nearly perfect theory, right? So you have to kind of give it some scale, and the way you do it is by fixing the the, the lattice regulators to some physical masses, which are here the pi and the kaons, and then the rest are just pure predictions. And and you also do that for one of the baryons. So here's the the cascade baryon, and the rest are pure predictions and you see that there's an extremely good agreement between the hadron spectrum and, and the theory from first principles lattice calculations. So this is really the strongest proof uh, that QCD is the correct theory of the strong interactions. So it's an intrinsically non-perturbative proof of the existence of this theory and, and, it's, it's a, and it being the correct theory of the physical world. Um, in fact, people have gone much further um, than this, so what is now shown here, it has reached a level of precision whereby you can put QCD plus QED on the lattice, and on the y-axis are, are the mass splittings of the, of the baryon multiplets. Um, and the scale is in MeV, the, in the previous plot the scale was in, in really thousands of MeV, and, and in this it's a few MeV, so the splitting between the proton and the neutron, which is this delta n here, uh, is just, it's on the order of one MeV. And to understand this, you also need QED. And that's why you have to put both on the lattice to understand the multiplets. And you see the beautiful agreement of the experiments. Uh, so, uh, so the experiment is this, this uh, gray band here. This is the uh, QCD plus QED calculation. Uh, and in some cases, it's, it was actually a prediction. So, so the data didn't exist for the splitting before the calculation, and you see there's very good agreement. And there's some cases where there's no experimental data yet, so this is a pure prediction. Uh, so this is really an incredible uh, achievement of, of, um, of QCD. Um, and, and also now, it's so precise that QCD is now being used as a tool to understand beyond the standard model physics. So, so uh, you might have heard that the muon G minus two experiment at Fermilab, which was first started at Brookhaven, uh, discovered that there's a 
you know, 3.4 sigma, I believe, discrepancy between theory and experiment. Uh, but a lot of that difference depends on computing hadron matrix elements uh, in lattice QCD. Uh, and so this has been a huge effort. Uh, and there's a nice physics report which summarizes the lattice uh, final results for these matrix elements, which then gave, uh, you know, Fermilab the, you know, kind of the necessary evidence to claim that there is some, something new perhaps beyond the standard model. It's not a five sigma effect yet. Uh, this, this thing is disputed. There are other lattice groups which get very different results. So this is something that will converge over time. But it just shows you that uh, QCD is now becoming so precise that it can allow us to learn about physics beyond the standard model with precision. Uh, and of course, uh, a, a, a another striking example of that is perturbative QCD, where uh, because of asymptotic freedom at very high resolutions, the coupling in QCD becomes very weak and you can do perturbation theory. Uh, and so what's shown here in this plot is the cross sections in proton-proton collisions of the production of W mesons, W plus, W minus, and this is data from the ATLAS and CMS experiments. And so these are QCD calculations, first principles QCD calculations in perturbative QCD, uh, where you kind of see the increasing in, uh, precision going from leading order, next to leading order, to next to next to leading order calculations to third power in the coupling. Uh, and you see the, the agreement with, with data getting better and better uh, with, with higher order calculations, uh, signaling this real precision for uncovering new physics. Uh, and likewise, on the right plot, you see then the Higgs production cross-section where you have gluon fusion, the gluon fusion channel to produce a Higgs boson with other stuff, which then decays into other stuff. And again, you see that as you go to higher and higher, so this is next to, next to, next to leading order calculation is this very narrow band here, uh, so reaching extremely high precision. Again, uh, providing us with a way to look for physics beyond the standard model. So a natural question to ask at this stage is that um, in particle physics, there's a very strong reductive tendency to try and understand things uh, in terms of the smaller and smaller ingredients going to higher and higher energy scales. Um, and from that perspective, which, which is a very powerful perspective, um, from that perspective, one could argue that the study of interactions strong interactions is a mature subject in the sense we have a theory, which is QCD, that's correct and complete, as both perturbation theory and lattice QCD tell us. Um, and in that sense, it's akin to a lot of other areas of physics, like atomic physics, condensed matter physics, or chemistry, where we understand the fundamentals, um, but these are whole fields in their own right, uh, where the important questions involve emergent phenomena and applications to real world problems. Um, and so the, um, the question is, are we done, right? But if that were the case, then you would empty a lot of physics departments very quickly. Well, some people might like that, <laughs> but, but the vast majority would have a problem with that. And, and rightly so, because um, a lot of what we think of as physics is emergent physics. And in fact, emergent physics can feed into fundamental physics. We've seen that a number of times where concepts from condensed matter um, and even nuclear physics uh, in the case of neutrino, understanding the neutrino mixings and so on. Uh, so you can have physics that's very complex, emergent physics, which can also feed back into thinking about um, more reductive kind of uh, fundamental physics. So in that sense, we are not done. Um, and in fact, that's going to be kind of the thrust of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Now, you can say, well, couldn't you just take your QCD theory and put it on this lattice and, and then compute everything, uh, you know, with that? And it turns out that in actually understanding a lot of physics, the lattice is not very useful yet. Um, because the very same techniques that allow you to compute those beautiful plots that I showed you establishing that QCD is the correct theory, the masses and uh, mass differences of hadrons, um, make it very challenging to understand uh, real-time problems and, and other kinds of uh, dynamical problems where um, uh, the lattice is really 
challenge very strongly. So the Monte Carlo methods that are used in, in lattice QCD don't work for those problems. And one needs new ideas. Uh, and so if you're a young person and you want to think of a big problem to solve and win a Nobel Prize, uh, that's, that's, one, that's a problem to start thinking about is you know, how do you uh, solve QCD in, in, in real time or for just dynamical processes. Um, and so let me kind of put that uh, problem in a, in a somewhat different light. Uh, so let's look at the following landscape, um, which I've plotted here. And the, and the axes of the landscape are inspired by deeply inelastic scattering. Uh, which led to asymptotic freedom, as I mentioned earlier. That is, when you have an electron emit a virtual photon with four momentum Q that probes inside the deepest recesses of the proton, what it encounters are these quarks and gluons, these quarks and gluon fields. Uh, and so the, in, in deep elastic scattering, the, the variables are the resolution. So Q squared is the momentum transfer squared. So as you increase Q squared, you're probing smaller and smaller distances inside the proton. Uh, and the other parameter on this axis is X. So this is Bjorkian X, uh, which reflects the, the, um, the energy of the interaction as well. So, um, so as you go to higher and higher energies, you're probing configurations inside the proton which have smaller and smaller fractions of the momentum carried by individual quarks and gluons. So you have more and more of these objects which carry smaller and smaller fractions. So as you go to, so think of this x-axis as increasing the energy and this y-axis as increasing the resolution. So at very high resolutions, this is where QCD uh, really can be thought of as a almost free theory. So this is asymptotic freedom of quarks and gluons. And, and you can do perturbation theory, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so that works very well. And this led to a Nobel Prize to Gross, Wilczek, and Pollitzer for this discovery. Now, as you go down in resolution, at some point, the coupling constant of the theory becomes stronger and stronger, and the physics becomes intrinsically non-perturbative. And that's why it's very important to find a non-perturbative definition of the theory, as the lattice does. And there you see the whole spectrum of hadrons that I showed you uh, from the lattice. And, and this is also where confinement and chiral symmetry breaking really become very important uh, in understanding structure in this landscape, in this, this area of the axis. However, now when you start going out in this direction, uh, when you are still at large Q squared, but when you start going to higher energies, you start becoming sensitive to very strongly correlated quark-gluon dynamics. Oops, I should be careful. <laughs> um, and this is like condensed matter physics. So we are finally, we've understood the theory in, in corners which are crucial, but now it's going to, we're now moving to understand its many body features. And as you know, in condensed matter physics, even though QED was a very successful theory, uh, a lot of condensed matter physics developed vastly uh, beyond that, in, by the invention of the renormalization group and so on, and the discovery of superconductors and superfluids and so on. Uh, and similarly, there's no reason to believe that similar rich phenomena cannot exist in QCD as you start probing this vast region here uh, of strongly correlated quark gluon dynamics. Uh, and, and some of it can be understood in terms of the evolution of these quarks and gluons and their dynamics to different scales. But then, as you go far enough along and at high enough energies, you, you form a state of high density matter, gluonic matter. Um, and this is just by deep plastic scattering experiments. So this is not in introducing finite temperature or, or baryon chemical potentials. So you get very dense matter. And then you get this region where, at, at, when, where the physics is non-perturbative, where for a long time, for 60 years, we have known that certain effective degrees of freedom describe the dynamics very well, but we don't understand why. Okay, so this is the region of total cross-sections. So we don't understand how to compute the total cross-section in QCD, even though we claim that is the correct theory. So there are many open questions. You know, what is the 3D structure of quark-gluon uh, matter in the proton? Uh, what, what is the nature of the spin uh, of, 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 of of uh, protons and nuclei. Uh, 
and, and many body correlations, multi-particle production, so on. So many open questions which are a result of this emergent phenomenon. I'm just going to outline some of them briefly. Um, so one question you can ask is, you know, what is this Palmer on? So as I mentioned, when you go to very high energies uh, at small momentum transfers, uh, the dynamics can be understood in terms of these Palmer on and Rayjohn trajectories. It's a very successful way of thinking phenomenologically about the nature of strong interactions, which predates QCD. Um, in fact, it's been known that the total cross section uh, over several orders of magnitude can be understood in terms of uh, the T channel exchange. Uh, so the, the scattering exchange of, of an object called the Pomeron. And, and this is an object with vacuum quantum numbers. So it has no conserved charges associated with it. Uh, and so I in fact, you can write down the amplitude for this for high energy scattering in terms of the so-called Mandelstam variables. The, the, the energy moment, sorry, the, the, the central mass energy squared and the momentum transfer squared in scattering can be parameterized as some, the energy to some power alpha of t, uh, where alpha of t is called a radio trajectory. And for the Pomeron, it has an intercept one. So when t is equal to zero, it has an intercept one plus some small additional number. Uh, and this object can be extracted from experiment. And you can also compute this alpha prime, which is related to something called the string tension, um, which is given in these units here. Uh, and so you can understand a lot of high energy scattering in terms of the, the vacuum exchange uh, of an object uh, of the sort, which um, in, in the simplest picture corresponds to a pole in the in the momentum transfer and angular momentum plane, so so-called TJ plane, and a simple pole in that in that uh, in that in that uh, plane is actually what explains the rise in total cross section. So it's a very beautiful picture in S matrix theory, uh, which explains all of this kind of feature. So it also explains why differential cross sections, as you go to higher and higher energies, have a shrinking slope. Uh, so it suggests that the proton actually grows logarithmically as you go to higher and higher energies. Uh, so all of this comes out from this Rayjet theory picture. Now in QCD, the only way we can understand this, so you can say, well, how do we understand these objects in QCD? The only way we understand this is, is in terms of perturbation theory, where you can show that at very high energies, this was shown by Lepato and collaborators, that you can uh, construct the Pomeron as some color singlet state, so it's no, with no net color, a compound state of the exchange of two so-called regiized gluons, um, and with the emission of gluons controlled by something called a Lepata vertex. So you have a very elaborate construction which explains such a Pomeron uh, in, as the exchange of regiized gluons and the color signal combination, which has vacuum quantum numbers. It turns out that this is not sufficient to explain this, these total cross sections. Uh, but it's still a very useful concept, and, and I'll sort of come back to that later. So this is one of the puzzles of the emergent dynamics of QCD. Uh, what explains total cross-sections okay, in, in, in nature? The other such thing has to do with the nature of chirality that I mentioned here, um, which is that we know that the spin of the proton is one half, but at the same time, we also know that the proton is a many-body system. It's not just you know, three quarks but it also contains gluons and C quarks, which are quark antiquark pairs. And so the question is, you know, how does the spin of quarks plus the spin of gluons plus all their angular momenta combine to form one half? Now we know that the spin of the quarks, sometimes called the helicity, is only 30% of the spin of the proton. And the rest must come from all these different objects in some non-trivial way. And so this is another puzzle, for example, that we don't understand. You know, how does the spin of the proton, such a basic question in QCD, you know, uh, how do you understand the spins of the hadrons in, in the spectrum? Uh, and that's something that we don't understand. Okay, so this is another puzzle that we have. And again, it's an emergent phenomena because we know it is a consequence of the many body dynamics of all of these stuff. Well, the third such thing is, is what happens to QCD when you heat up the theory. So you take QCD and you put it in a box and you heat it up. Well, in practice, what you do, and this is the original idea of uh, T.D. Lee, uh, 
was that you collide nuclei at very high energy. So you take heavy nuclei like gold or lead and you collide them at close to the speed of light. And when you do so, you kind of heat up matter. So here's the phase diagram of QCD, just like in condensed matter physics, you have a similar phase diagram. So you have the, here the temperature in MeV units and, and on the Y, on the x-axis you have the baryon density, so the net number of baryons that are generated in the collision. Now, uh, the early universe corresponds to a trajectory with very low baryon density. So, you know, the baryon, dense, the baryon to photon ratio is one part in 10 to the 9 or so. Um, and so, so the universe has very low baryon density but at very high temperatures kind of evolved in this way here. In heavy ion collisions, what you have is you generate very hot matter, and then at very, very high energies, the barrier density is also very low. So these are the Rick and LHC heavy ion colliders. So you, they form a trajectory like this in the phase diagram. And then as you go to lower and larger heavy ion collisions, you, you, try to, you start to explore this region here of larger barrier densities and lower temperatures. Uh, and then there could be a very rich structure there. So you can have a very rich phase diagram where at very high temperatures you have quarks and gluons which are free, they're deconfined due to the asymptotic freedom of QCD. But then there could be critical phenomena, so you could have a transition between quarks and gluons to confined hadrons as shown by these blobs here. And there's an interesting question of how that occurs at different points in the phase diagram. Okay, so here, for example, is shown a line of first order phase transitions which ends um, in, in, in a critical point, but then there can be non-trivial other phases like the quarkionic phase or color superconductivity at very high baryon densities uh, that, that sits here. And of course, this is very important for us to understand also the physics of neutron stars, right? So neutron stars are objects with very, very high baryon densities, um, and, and so there's a there's an interesting question whether the deepest recesses of neutron stars are quark stars. So are there quarks which are really at the highest baryon densities inside neutron stars? And how does that affect the properties of neutron stars? So there's, there's a set of really interesting questions in this regard. Now one of the great achievements of the lattice, I should mention, is uh, something that science has also been a part of um, through the, the hot QCD collaboration is the determination of the crossover temperature from a hadron gas to a quark gluon plasma. So as you heat up uh, uh, hadrons, so protons and neutrons and other subatomic particles, there is a crossover into a quark gluon plasma and this is now determined with precision. So this is something that can go into the particle data book as the crossover temperature is 156.5 plus minus 1.5 MeV. So this corresponds to about 2 trillion degrees Kelvin. So this is 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. So this is the hottest matter that we create on Earth, uh, and the crossover temperature has been determined from the lattice. And these are temperatures that are measured by the Rick and LSC heavy ion colliders. The other very interesting um, emergent phenomena in, in, in the strong interactions also comes from these heavy ion experiments is that when you collide to heavy ions, uh, typically the heavy ions are not, they're not circular objects or spheres with uniform density. They have very different spatial anisotropies of matter. And so when you collide this, these objects, you, you deposit energy density, which is very anisotropic. And then there's, there's this spatial anisotropy, which is, you know, very, 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 has very large gradients it very efficiently converts itself to momentum space and isotropy of particles that are produced. And that is seen in the azimuthal distribution. So this is a beautiful plot of a thousand particles emerging from a heavy ion collision at the Rick Collider. So this is from the star detector at Brookhaven's Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. And by looking at the azimuthal distribution of all these thousand particles and constructing moments, Fourier moments of these distribution, you can, you can understand that these such spatial anisotropies are very efficiently converted to momentum anisotropies through hydrodynamics. So hydrodynamics provides a very 
good description of this phenomena of spatial anisotropies. And so there's an outstanding question. So from very violent nuclear collision, right, on, on the order of, you know, two and higher trillion degrees being generated, to suddenly you form this kind of quark lone plasma. And this object that you create is a nearly perfect, in a different sense from the perfect that I used before, it's a nearly perfect fluid in the sense that it has perhaps the lowest viscosity to entropy density ratio of any material that is created on Earth. Um, and, and which means that the resistance of this object to any kind of a stress is, is the lowest perhaps in nature. So how does this very violent state go through some kind of highly non-equilibrium process and form a thermal state? So what is the thermalization process? This is another very interesting emergent phenomena that we don't understand. So, so I'm going to argue to you that a lot of these, some of these things at least, can be understood in terms of the formation of classical lumps in high energy QCD. And that starts from the recognition that the proton is a complex many body system. So when you, when you do deep plastic scattering experiments at very high momentum resolutions and energies, you find that the, the, the proton is this very complex object. And here's a plot of the parton distributions inside the proton as a function of the momentum fraction carried by a parton. And you see that as you go to higher and higher energies where partons carry smaller and smaller momentum fractions, the proton is completely dominated by gluons. This is a log plot. So you see that the gluons are, are a factor of, I don't know, on the order of a thousand or so here at a given x larger than that of valence quarks. Uh, at sufficiently small x, and they start to dominate already at x fractions of, of, of 0.1. So this is one lesson you can take away from this talk, is that the, the proton is really dominated by gluons and C quarks at very high energies. How do we understand this in QCD? So imagine that you're looking at a proton at rest, okay? So it's at low energies, and it has these valence quarks. So these carry the quantum numbers of the proton. So these are the two up quarks and down quarks. So they are the conserved charges, right? They carry baryon number and electric charge. But, and think of them as being dressed by quantum fluctuations, okay? So these are dressed by quantum fluctuations. Now, if you boost the proton to very high energies, what happens is that these quantum fluctuations start to live longer and longer. Okay? Um, and so there's many, many more of these quantum fluctuations. And so the process is Markovian, uh, just like COVID. And so, as we know with COVID, things can happen very quickly. So, so at a, any given scale, in, in with, so if you have a configuration with certain momentum fraction, uh, there's a, there's a, the, 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 at the next step in, in, as you boost the proton with increasing energy, the, the, the change in the number is proportional to the number. So it's an exponential growth. It's a Markovian process. But it's a Markovian process in the log of this X of the X fraction, so it's called a rapidity. Uh, so the exponential of a log is a power law, and so what you find is that you get power law growth in the number of partons with smaller and smaller fractions of, of, the, of the momentum of the proton. So one way to think about it is that the proton can fluctuate on very short time scales into configuration carrying a large number of gluons and C quarks, and if you have sufficiently high energies, a probe can see those short-lived configurations, and those are the dominant configurations that you see. So then the question is, okay, what happens? How do we un understand uh, this very rapid growth? In, and so does it temper off at some point, right? Do you reach herd immunity? Uh, and so this is a kind of picture of a, of a proton and, and which is growing, you know, with the popcorn kernels are just sort of blowing up. And the question is, does it blow the lid of the proton? How does it maintain its stability? as you go to higher and higher energies. And so this is the phenomenon of gluon saturation that is dynamically generated by the theory uh, to, to cure this very rapid growth. So one way to think about this is that, imagine you are at some resolution scale where the proton is made up of quarks and gluons. So these are the partons. And so as you increase the energy, so as you boost the proton to higher and higher energies relative to a probe, then what happens is that for a fixed resolution, the number of these partons starts to grow. And at some point, at some given scale, 
the, the proton becomes closely packed. Okay, the occupancy becomes the maximal you can have in nature, which is one over the coupling. So the, the, the occupation number becomes one over alpha s. And that can occur for no matter any given resolution that you have, there's always a boost or an x value for which the proton becomes cl closely packed. Okay? And this is a kind of unitarization boundary. Okay? And there's a scale which characterizes this close packing and that's sometimes called a saturation scale. That's a Q squared for which at a given x you have close packing. So what happens is the color charge inside the proton as seen by a probe is completely screened. So if you have, say, a virtual photon which splits into a pair of quarks, a quark and anti-quark, with some size much smaller than the size of the proton, at sufficiently high boosts relative to this quark-anti-quark -quark pair, the proton, the, this, this, the color charge that this object is seeing goes to zero, okay? And this object interacts just like a proton would. So no matter how small this quark-anti-quark -quark pair, if the proton is being boosted relative to it at very high energies, it's going to interact with the same strength as a much larger proton would. would. So this, ob this is called uh, gluon saturation, and it's a many-body effect in QCD. It, it's just like condensed matter physics. There's screening and recombination effects going on. Uh, and this, this object forms a kind of classical lump, and the reason it forms a classical lump is that the occupancy is 1 over alpha s. And, and not only that, Right, not only does it form a classical lump, as I mentioned, it unitarizes the cross-section. So the, the S matrix for the cross-section goes very rapidly to zero. Okay, so it's, it sees a completely opaque disk with which no matter how small the quark-anti-quark -quark pair is, it, it interacts with unit strength. Now, this scale, the saturation scale is precocious in nuclei relative to protons because there's a very large coherence length in the nucleus where the, the, the quark-anti-quark -quark pair can interact coherently with many, many color charges. And so if you had an, another scale here with nuclear size, you'll see that the saturation, the close packing scale is much bigger for a nucleus than the proton. Okay. So here's another way of thinking about it. So if you think about a 2 to n process in QCD, where you're producing a large number of soft particles, and you try to estimate what is the probability for producing these n particles. So there, there, there would be a factor from the coupling, which is alpha to the n, so because you're producing n particles. Then there is a combinatorial n factorial for the many different ways in which you can, you can produce these particles. And then in principle, there is an entropy factor, which is e to the s. So it's the degeneracy of the number of microstates that you have in the theory. Now, if n is equal to 1 over alpha s, right, if the number of particles are very closely packed, you produce a large number, then you see that this alpha to the n, can, if I substitute and use Stirling's formula, right, which is n factorial is n to the n times e to the minus n, and you plug in this one over alpha, you see that these factors all cancel. Um, these factors get canceled except you have this e to the minus one over alpha. Okay, so when alpha is very small, you think that the formation of such a classical lump is exponentially suppressed by e to the minus n. However, and this is a conventional wisdom that people often have in thinking about such scattering, however, this entropy factor can be very large. And if this entropy factor is on the order of itself of order one over alpha, you see that the probability becomes of order one. Okay. So for states with very high entropy, right, when the number of degenerate microstates is very large, right, that you can count, nearly degenerate microstates is very large, then you see that you get a probability of order one. And the way you can understand this was actually taught to us by Coleman. You can think if you look in the, in the, if you look in the action of the path integral um, for, for say any kind of gauge a field theory, so you imagine you have some configuration of fields phi of z, and you look for the real and imaginary part of the action, you can identify some kind of classical path in Euclidean space that is generated by such a configuration and then this is sometimes called a bound solution. And this object can then decay in real time producing lots of particles. Okay? Uh, and, and some of the origins of this goes back to work in condensed matter physics by Jim Langer. Uh, but, but this is something Coleman described in, in the language of, of uh, quantum field theory.
So, so it may be that such multi-particle production where you produce lots of soft particles may really be the formation of a classical lump that then decays. And we can understand this in some kind of an effective field theory that's called the color glass condensate. That's something I've worked on. Where the way to think about the problem is imagine now you have some dipole, some small object probing inside the hadron and it's looking at these many uh, gluon configurations. So if the dipole is at rest and it's moving and, and you're looking in a frame where the hadron is moving very fast, then the objects, the valence quarks in the hadron are moving close to the light cone. So they're moving close to their light cone. And since they're moving close to the light cone, you can think of them as very heavy particles. The, the, the closer a particle is moving to the speed of light, it's very hard to deflect its trajectory. It's almost, you can think of it like a static object in the light cone. And so essentially you have a separation of heavy degrees of freedom corresponding to particles moving close to the light cone. So these are the large x degrees of freedom, uh, large momentum fractions. And then the small x degrees of freedom, which are, which are, are much more dynamical, are, are these are the small x gluons of QCD. So these are the V partons, and they are the objects that then scatter at high energies of this probe, which is this quark-antiquark -quark pair, which is emitted by a virtual photon. Uh, and so this, because there's a separation of heavy and light scales, there's this Born-Oppenheimer kind of approximation between fast and slow modes. It's the same reason why if you want to understand the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, you can treat the nucleus of the hydrogen atom as a static quantity and just look at the dynamics, one body problem of the dynamics of the electron uh, or, or a few electrons in that background. Uh, and so similarly, there's a, such a, and, and, and when you have this, you have a classic effective field theory kind of description. And furthermore, there's a, because of this natural separation of time scales, you have a Wilsonian kind of renormalization group which at each scale in the evolution of this hadron, so as you move to faster and faster energies of the smaller and smaller x, you have a separation between these sources, which are these static heavy degrees of freedom, and the fields, which are these dynamical degrees of freedom. And as you change the scale, as you make the hadron faster and faster, you get a kind of renormalization group description, which is independent then of the scale separating the large x degrees of freedom from the small x degrees of freedom. And so this, this theory is called a color glass condensate. Color, of course, because these, are, these carry color charge, the quarks and gluons carry color charge. It's a glass because the time scales over which these heavy particles evolve is much different from the time scales over which the small x light degrees of freedom evolve. So on the time scales of these light degrees of freedom, this is essentially a static distribution, which is a random distribution uh, for different configurations of the collision. So that's a stochastic process, and that's where the glass comes from. And it's a condensate because for each configuration of this, of this, of the large x degrees of freedom, the object that's scattering really sees a condensate. It sees a highly occupied state with a non-trivial expectation value of color fields, and that's a condensate. And so this is this matter that, that, uh, that is created in very high energies uh, and it has some very rich properties. Uh, so in fact, you can understand this object uh, in terms of the correlator so-called light-like Wilson lines which describe this dynamics. And so you see that you initially at the lower energies which is corresponding to very low values of this rapidity, you have big lumps of these classical charges that I was mentioning and then as you go to higher and higher energies, they form smaller and smaller lumps, which are more and more energetic. Uh, and these are very localized inside the proton. Uh, and it's these objects that actually um, participate in high energy scattering. Uh, and in fact, this is not just a cartoon. This is coming from a simulation of the actual dynamics that's solved in this effective field theory, where for any operator, which may be some correlator of Wilson lines or other such non-trivial operators, you can write the dynamics in, in a Fokker-Planck kind of equation. So this looks like a Fokker-Planck equation where the boost, the rapidity, is like a time. And then the change of the degrees of freedom with the color charge is like, is like that of a diffusion equation with a diffusion coefficient given here. And, and essentially, because it's a Fokker-Planck equation, you can understand the dynamics of these very soft V partons uh, as, as a kind of Langevin kind of diffusion.
in the space of these colored charges. Okay? And that describes this very rich many-body physics of these multi polymeron type interactions that you have in QCD. Okay? Uh, and that goes well beyond this original BFKL polymeron construction that I mentioned earlier, which is a compound color singlet state of gluons. And, and this is a very successful framework now. We, have, we can do things now at, at next to leading order uh, accuracy uh, and describe data both from deep plastic scattering. So this is deep plastic scattering structure functions as a function of Q squared uh, for different values of this of, of BRK and X. Uh, so this is described very well. And the same parameters also describe the uh, single inclusive particle production at the LFC to high orders. Uh, and you see that as you change the boosts, which is the rapidity for different PT windows, uh, you find very good agreement with data. Okay? Uh, and this is something that we will be testing at the Electron 9 Collider with high precision for a number of final states. So for example, here are jets that are formed along with photons, and you can calculate such things and compare such classical lump predictions with, with actual data. So where it's actually very powerful is in the description of heavy ion collision. So if you think about the collision of two nuclei from first principles, it's an almost impossible problem. You have all these nucleons and all these color charges. How do you describe that from first principles in QCD and get some predictive power? However, if the theory becomes classical at very high energies, then what you have is that the collision of these objects is a collision of these two color glass condensates, which are shock waves. These are gluon shock waves, which you can treat classically and, and semi-classically. And this is something that has been done over the last 20 years or so. And an extremely rich picture emerges of how these gluons collide and form non-equilibrium matter. And they go through uh, you know, phenomena like weak, weak wave turbulence where the system flows to non-thermal attractors and eventually equilibrates. Uh, and this kind of, and then there are things like hydrodynamic attractors and so on. So if you're interested, I have a review of modern physics that discusses this in detail. Let me just very briefly tell you though that this is very analogous to what happens in the Big Bang. Okay? So in the Big Bang, you have some classical lump, which is an inflaton field, and that, that inflaton field decays, and eventually it goes through a series of phase transitions, including the quark gluon phase transition. Uh, and then eventually, so there's a decoupling of matter and radiation about 300,000 year, 300, years after the Big Bang. Uh, and then of course, you know, we are sitting here um, you know, 13.7 billion years away. And similarly, there's a little bang in heavy ion collision where you have these classical fields, just like the inflaton, uh, form some non-equilibrium matter called the plasma. And then this kind of evolves to form a quark gluon plasma in a very non-trivial way. Uh, and this analogy is not very, is, is not just fanciful. There's a really one-to-one -one correspondence between different aspects of the evolution of these two systems which is very analogous in, and helps you understand thermalization in the two systems. Uh, in fact, there are these classical fields, they interact with quantum fluctuations. You have explosive amplification of low momentum fluctuations, which actually thermalizes the system and eventually creates objects which are, which are actual you know, particle-like degrees of freedom with, with, with large occupation numbers. Uh, and this is something that we actually see in numerical simulations. So we can actually collide these shock waves together. And initially you have these very highly occupied fields which then in interact with quantum fluctuations which create instabilities like plasma instabilities. So on, the, on this axis is shown the, the uh, longitudinal momentum. On this axis is the transverse momentum. So initially the fields are highly Lorentz contracted. They have no longitudinal momentum. But through the interaction of quantum fluctuations with these, with these highly occupied fields, they very quickly become overoccupied both in longitudinal and in transverse momentum. And these are results of you know, classical simulations of 3 plus 1 d gluon fields which generate such kind of highly occupied matter. Uh, and in such matter, you also see that you have things like topological transitions in these classical lumps. So if you take these very hot configurations and you cool them down, you see that they kind of line up along integer valued uh, configurations corresponding to different values of churn simons charge. So this is topological charge, which is integer valued. And so you see the emergence of topological features when you look at these soft degrees of freedom in such classical lumps. Uh, 
both at finite temperature and off equilibrium. In fact, such topological transitions are, are responsible for creating a chiral current in the QGP, which is in the presence of an external magnetic field, as you have in heavy ion collisions, um, which are some of the hottest, which are some of the strongest electromagnetic fields in nature. It's about 10 to the 18 Gauss. Uh, and they create a current, in such a topological current, uh, and this is something that is being looked for in heavy ion collisions. So um, I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, how am I doing? I'm kind of late, right? So I should, I should kind of wrap up soon. Um, so this kind of picture allows you to, to uh, understand how thermalization actually occurs in practice, that what you see is in the collision of these lumps, you have a rapid scrambling of information in these classical fields by quantum fluctuations. And then there's a competition between dilution due to the Hubble expansion of the system. So it's like in the early universe, there's a, there's a separation between the transverse and longitudinal momentum distributions. And then you have collisions which are trying to isotropize the system. And there's a kind of competition between the two. And what happens is you start from these classical, very non-equilibrium initial conditions. The system flows to a non-thermal fixed point characterized by these universal numbers. So the behavior becomes self-similar, like in weak wave turbulence, and then eventually the system thermalizes. And this physics is universal, actually, as we discovered, that it's something that you also see in cold atomic gases. So if you plot the evolution of cold atomic gases with the same initial conditions as with this quark gluon plasma, you find that you, the critical exponents that describe their real-time evolution are identical in the two systems. So the hottest matter on Earth and the coldest matter on Earth with the right initial conditions belong in the same universality real -time, uh, of, of real-time exponents uh, uh, in their evolution. So this is something quite striking. And experiments have been done actually at uh, Heidelberg uh, where they put rubidium atoms, they create a Bose-Einstein condensate of them in an optical trap and then let them evolve in time and they find that the evolution of these objects, which is typically characterized in terms of momentum and time, can be written entirely in terms of just momentum scaled by the time to some factor and they, when they scale these numbers, they can extract some universal curve with these critical exponents here, very similar to what I was talking about. So we have a way now to understand thermalization from first principles in the picture, this, this classical picture that I had, where you start from the system of these classical lumps, there's a kind of memory loss and the system flows to a non-thermal fixed point characterized by self-similar turbulence. And then eventually it goes through a kinetic process where it then evolves to thermal equilibrium. And in terms, you can actually calculate with just this one parameter, the close packing parameter of this classical lump, the thermalization temperature and the thermalization time up to some coefficients of order one uh, of such a system, which is remarkable for such a complex system. With just one parameter, you can actually compute. In fact, you can show that if you take the close packing scale to infinity and very high energies, the system thermalizes almost instantaneously, even for the smallest systems. So the claim is that if you take a proton-proton collision, right, these are the smallest systems in nature, and you collide them at sufficiently high energies, that the matter that you forms will thermalize on time scales much smaller than the size of the proton. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of quite a remarkable prediction. It seems to be borne out actually by experiments at the LHC. Uh, so I'm kind of running out of time. I just want to mention that this is this matter is actually, there's a picture in which this is really dual to what happens in a black hole. So uh, I don't have time to go into this here, but this, you can, there's a picture of black holes due to Dwali and collaborators where they think about black holes as such similarly highly occupied systems, where the occupancy for a solar mass black hole can be 10 to the 66, so it's very highly occupied. Uh, but at the same time, you can think of it as some saturated state in a very similar fashion of soft gravitons. And so what we have conjectured with Dwali, and if you're interested, you can take a look, is that at this maximal occupancy where the coupling in gravity times the occupancy is of order one, the physics of saturated gluons and gravitons is universal. And you can really map your properties right onto one, one, one onto the other and at, this, at this unitary point, 
And you can actually show that this color glass also satisfies the Bekenstein entropy bound. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, oh, because uh, you know you you need to the, the the claim is that I mean these are very different states in general, right? So gluons, so gluons are weakly interacting at short distances and strongly interacting at large distances, but gravitons are exactly the opposite. So in general, they are completely different theories. However, when the occupancy of this object becomes very large, right, the physics becomes universal between the two, in the sense that it's just characterized by its macroscopic properties. It's not, it's not sensitive to the details of the system. And you can just think of such overoccupied states in the language of Bekenstein, right, as, as objects that really maximize the information content in the system. Uh, and so we can discuss this more, but this is a very specific limit in which the two theories look exactly the same. In fact, I'm not someone who works in black hole physics, but I was able to understand a tremendous amount of black hole physics just by understanding this analogy between the two, where the saturation scale can be thought of as the inverse of the Schwarzschild radius, uh, and there's a real map into the dynamics of the two theories. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a very famous paper by Lenny Susskind, which led to holography in, in, in quantum field theory as we know it, and it's all based on the language of weak partons. So if you read this paper, which is a really beautiful paper, he talks about weak partons and his, his, all his picture is in terms of understanding in terms of QCD in many ways. Uh, and in fact, he thanks Lepadov for these discussions. But none of these papers, including the ones by Lepadov and his collaborators, where they look at like gravity shock waves, um, the scattering of black holes scattering or trans Planckian scattering in gravity and in QCD. So this is a classic paper by Lepato. Uh, none of them discuss this physics of parton saturation which I've been developing. Okay, and this is actually the basis of this work by Duali and myself. Um, and so on. so I, I, there are other connections between the two theories. So gra gravity and QCD can be understood uh, with gravity as in, one, in a particular sense as a square of QCD. And this has led to a tremendous amount of progress um, in, 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 in sort of the links between the two theories, actually even quantitative progress. Uh, so I'm way over time. I just very briefly want to mention the EIC since it's my fiducial duty as someone from Brookhaven. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is a powerful new femtoscope, as I mentioned. It's a $2 billion collider. It's approved. It's actually construction is underway. Um, and it consists of polarized protons with energies up to 275 GB, nuclei up to zero ray times that, so about 100 GB or so, and we'll have electron beams up to 18 GB with central mass energies of up to 140 uh, GB. And the point is that this has a uh, luminosity which is more than a thousand times that of the Hera Collider. So just to put this in context, the Hera Collider took data over 15 years and the EIC, in principle, if, if you achieve the design luminosity, will have the same data in a few months. Okay, so, so 15 years of running will be reproduced by data in one month. Okay, and so this allows you to ask a lot of differential questions in QCD. So, for example, you could ask, you know, if you have some partons sitting here in some spatial distribution of partons, you know, and, and it's a polarized proton, you know, what is the distribution of up and down quarks, for example, in momentum space or in, or, in, so, or in coordinate space? So you can ask very differential questions about the spatial tomography and momentum tomography of partons that you could never do before. And this will hopefully give us fundamental insight from experiments into the nature of confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. So those are the big goals. And here's my last slide that the, the idea is to understand the origin of nuclear mass, the origin of nuclear spin, highly occupied states of gluons, that's a color glass condensate, and in general, a nucleon tomography which will explore the entire landscape of the strong interaction. So, so really move towards a condensed matter phase of QCD where we explore with high precision all kinds of emergent phenomena. We can have quantum phase transitions occurring in that landscape which will sort of paint a very rich picture. So I'll just leave you with my very last slide. So I've outlined the rich physics emerging from metastable lumpy configurations. And it has, as I mentioned, very rich uh, interdisciplinary analogies and concrete connections. 
Uh, and hopefully these may provide fresh insight and methods to confront the enduring mysteries of QCD. Uh, and of course, experiment is always what is motivating us, and that's something that will exist for several decades from now. So thank you very much, and I apologize for going over time quite, quite a bit. Thank you. landscape of uh, things that are going on in QCD. So questions, comments? Hi, uh, maybe a knife question, but so we have a, from the black hole literature, we have a bound on how fast a system can thermalize, like the scrambling time in some sense. So you made one claim that at some point, like uh, the thermalization is almost instantaneous. So isn't it violating that bound? Like no, it's a, it's actually it's a, when I say instantaneous, I mean parametrically in the sense that uh, it's actually very it's uh, the the um, the thermalization time, for example, in black hole stuff is one of the temperature of the black hole right. times say up to logs. Yes. Uh, and what we get is something which is one over QS times logs. Uh, so okay. it's exactly the same thing. The mechanism is different. In the case of black holes, it's Lyapunov behavior, Correct. it's parametric resonance. Correct. Here it's Weibel instabilities. But the details are very different of how the states are reached, right? But it's as efficient a scrambler, mm -hmm. uh, well, up to logs. It's one log weaker scrambler than, mm -hmm. than that in black holes. But it's a very efficient scrambler. So that's why thermalization is very fast. So it's a yeah, better, right. like it's yeah. a more improved bound compared to what we have from the on the black holes, is it? it it's it's a weaker bound because it has an additional log. Ah, I see. But okay. but in terms of powers, it's the same. Okay. So so if you take so if you take the black hole temperature to be larger and larger, right? Then you know you will find that you know it will thermalize more and more rapidly. The same thing is occurring here. Thank you. Uh, we actually discussed this in the paper with Duali, so you can take a look also. Uh, a, a small comment. Yeah. See, at very high energies, the pa all particles behave like massless particles. Because E squared is called a P squared, that's whatever mass is irrelevant. So, in principle, that they, they all behave like massless particles, it has only transverse degrees of freedom. Now, when it is small, corrected by a small amount, when it is not that high energy, they seem to acquire small mass, which is providing you the longitudinal component of the degrees of freedom. So, at high energy, extremely high energies, but not so high energies, there are these longitudinal modes which come up. And if you can directly talk about those modes, uh, living probably as hologram, etc., you can describe the system uh, in the dual picture that seems to be happening in all these things. Uh, would you like to make any remark on this kind of observation? So, so, so when you say mass, I mean, what, what is, I mean, you, you don't want to violate gauge invariance, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the problem with, you know, things acquiring mass in gauge theories is, you know, the original question why Yang and Mills had a lot of problem uh, with their theory because it predicted massless gluons, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, where, where do the masses come from? So, so in gauge theories, how things acquire mass is, is, is very problematic in, in, in kind of understanding this. So what we are, the, the picture that we have is, is really that of strong fields, uh, which, which are, uh, all you need is classicalization and unitarization. Mm -hmm. These are the only ingredients that are necessary to create a 2D picture mm -hmm. of the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so to generate this area law. Mm -hmm. So essentially the picture is that you get an area law mm -hmm. which is characterized by some scale. And you can think of that as a kind of Goldstone scale. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if you think about this in terms of Goldstone degrees of freedom, yes then the goldstones can be understood as objects that then acquire some mass. Mm -hmm. So they have some kind of a screening mass mm 
Uh, and then you can think of those objects as decaying on some characteristic time scale and then eventually what you observe are the massless. So on some time scales, you can think about these things as, uh, as massive objects which are nearly degenerate objects which have some entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the language of Goldstone, degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can think about a mechanism whereby just like Goldstones acquire mass, mm -hmm. these objects acquire mass but only for some time scale. Mm -hmm. Now in the case of black holes, that time scale is longer than the lifetime of the universe. So from any practical point of view, these non-equilibrium degrees of freedom look like they're equilibrium degrees of freedom, they're vacuum degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. Because the lifetime of a black hole is its occupancy times three halves. That's the page law. Mm -hmm. And so 10 to the 66 times three halves is, is much longer than the lifetime of our universe. Mm -hmm. So, so the Goldstone picture for black holes is actually pretty robust. Uh, so maybe there's a way to think about it along those lines, if yeah. that's what you have in mind. Yeah, but a minor comment is uh, the yeah. relation between gauge invariance and mass right. is slightly tricky because we have spontaneous symmetric breakdown where the theory is actually gauge invariant, but mass is also there uh, in a different phase, and that's fairly obvious in U1 kind of abelian theory where you can generate it by some kind of Stuckelberg field, the face of the Higgs particle, etc. So in principle we have to have a better understanding of the phase transitions which are taking place through uh, uh, a large number of particles together in a conduct like condensed matter system, like condensates and both ends to condensates, etc. So, so, so very good because in fact this, this this, you remember I mentioned this Born-Oppenheimer separation mm. uh, where I have these very highly occupied static degrees of freedom. Mm. These are Stuckelberg fields actually yeah. and they do form such a condensate. Mm -hmm. And so you can think about then the degrees of freedom as excitations around this condensate. Mm -hmm. And that's how these excitations, so that's, those are the Goldstone modes mm -hmm. and so they effectively acquire degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. In fact there was a paper by Bjorkane from the early 60s and mm -hmm. also then by Nielsen and Chadda later where they kind of try to understand uh, aspects of gauge theories in this language. Mm -hmm. But they weren't really thinking in terms of high occupancy. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that at high energies there's a natural mechanism of high occupancy where the Stuckelberg mechanism is just natural. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's, uh, there's yeah. In one of your slides yeah. you yeah. mentioned about superfluid bosons. Yes. So mentioned. Yes. Do you mean uh, both instant condensate boson, both and condensate or superfluid? So, so, so um, th this was in the context of cold atoms, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so the if you look at a scalar theory, then these are really superfluids. Mm -hmm. So they obey the Gross-Potapsky equation, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so they have some order parameter with a phase. Mm -hmm. they, they obey the equations of superfluid hydrodynamics. Yeah. yeah but yeah. you have to make distinction between both engine condensate and superfluid in some sense, right? Well, I mean. Why? I mean, <laughs> well, it, it, this, it, if you ask condensed matter physics it, yeah. people, they will say they are different. That's not because so. Because the energy momentum dispersion relation, one of them will have uh, linear and another will be quadratic. Ah, very, very good. So, mm. so, so the, so the uh, extremely good point, which is the picture that I have in mind is a relativistic scalar field theory. Mm. And so in the far infrared, this is like a non-relativistic superfluid. Mm -hmm. However, it really depends on the inertial domain of momentum of interest. Mm -hmm. That is, if you look at the full spectrum, there is also then the relativistic regime that emerges. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you can simulate such things now in great detail and really understand the turbulent spectrum of this, these theories. Okay. And there's, Kolmogorov, there's a Kolmogorov scaling, there is inverse cascades and then form, form. So there's a whole non-equilibrium generalization of these concepts where these distinctions are not so clear anymore. So in other words, there will be superfluid like inertial regimes and then there'll be Bose-Einstein condensate kind of inertial regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, really, but the general concept is that of turbulent dynamics. So you'll have things like vortices Mm -hmm. form, if you look at 2 plus 1D, say, then you'll see vortices form and you see the vortices merge mm 
uh, through some kind of annealing process or you know coarsening process, which has characteristic time scales, uh, and then these then form over time a superfluid. So so there's there's very non-trivial dynamics that's yeah, going, going on. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's quantum turbulence and. So uh, when you yeah, yeah. talk about the universal features for thermalization right. in gauge theories and scalar fields, so in scalar fields, of course, as you mentioned, there can be condensates. In gauge theories, are there the condensates form, or it proceeds by different mechanisms? So, so, so it's a, the so that, that's a good question in the sense that we don't know for sure um, because we don't have a clean order parameter in, in which to really uh, analyze this. Uh, in, 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 in sort of a clean way. Um, there, there's actually hints from numerical lattice simulations, but these are of classical lattice gauge theories that you see that the, in the far infrared, you see uh, condensate-like phenomena, but you know, there's no actual robust order parameter as like in the, in the scalar theory. So you don't know if what you're seeing is, uh, is, is something that is, I mean, because what you do is you're, you, you kind of, when you look at say momentum spectra, right, you fix a gauge and then you look to see whether you're, you're flowing to the IR, but this isn't a gauge fixed description. So it's not obvious that there's a gauge independent way to ascertain uh, such, such a phenomenon. Uh, but but what, I'm, what I'm talking about is that there's a, like I was mentioning in my previous comments, that there's different regions of inertial initial regions of momenta as in the context of turbulence and the mapping that I was talking between QCD and uh, you know ultra cold atoms uh, is, is in a different region of inertial momenta than of the far infrared and it's in that region that you see this universal behavior between the two. In the far infrared we don't know if it's the same universality class. So the same universality class corresponds to a particular re inertial region of momenta that, that is more robust, hopefully. And for gravity, yeah, the yeah. Uh, correspondence is more in the far infrared. The, the, the correspondence is, is in neither because, as, as I mentioned, in gravity, gravity becomes strongly interacting as you go to the UV. But this formation of a black hole occurs before you reach the, the, the Planck scale. And so it's, it's an intermediate scale where you see this emergent phenomena, which is the formation of a horizon. Uh, and the same thing is true in QCD. The classical lumps form before you reach the IR. So the color screening occurs on a, on a sort of a smaller distance scale in QCD than it does at the confinement scale. And so this is a, a kind of remarkable thing that in the sense that it's in both theories is a regi regime where you can actually m perform computations. Because in gravity then otherwise you would be in the quantum gravity regime and you couldn't really calculate. Mm -hmm. While in QCD you would be in the confining regime and you couldn't calculate. But if this picture is correct then there's universal behavior in regimes where you can calculate and compare universal properties. Thanks. Any more hands raised? So let's thank uh, Professor Vain Gopal again for an excellent talk. I'd like to thank also the people who asked questions. I think it really added to the content. So thank yeah, you thank very much. Thank you very much. Thank you,